This video is basically going to be a summary or review of uh, many of the topics we've been talking about in the last bunch of videos. Now the $60 billion question is, what is a magnet? I think this is the essence of, of what we're trying to get at, at least what I'm trying to get at in this video series. And so the companion question to that is, what is magnetism? Now, a lot of people use this word magnetism and many people, it, it means different things. It seems to mean different things to different people. And so I couldn't help but notice that the, that the word magnet, magnetism ends in ism. Now we have the word electric and we have the word magnetic and we have the word electricity and we have the word magnetism. Now, many of the words that end in, mag in um, ism, okay, I'm gonna name a few just for an example. We have uh, fascism, communism, socialism, Buddhism, Catholicism, Judaism, capitalism, existentialism, totalitarianism. So all of those things are associated with belief systems or systems of collective thought. And so I couldn't help but wonder if, if magnetism isn't a system of collective thought in the, in the sense that nobody really knows what magnetism is or nobody seems to be able to explain clearly what magnetism is. And so it's become an ism, it's become a belief system, it's become a system of collective thought. And so, you know, part of what I'm trying to do is dispel the ism, the belief, and uh, give you something a little bit more real. So in a previous video, we talked about what is a field. I tried to answer the question, what is a field? And my attempt was to develop an unambiguous definition of field that everyone would agree upon and that wouldn't cause confusion. And so I came up with this definition. A field is a region of the universe where each location in the field of view is assigned a physical quantity. Now this word quantity seems to confound some people because people have their own idea of what a quantity is. And so in, in mathematics, Quantities can be values like one, two, three, or a voltage reading or something, you know, that is, has a magnitude and that's called a scalar. You can also have a vector. Now a vector is basically a pointer. It points to something. Um, and so anything that's a vector usually has a little arrow. So whenever you see a little arrow in, in a mathematical equation, you know that whether they're talking about a vector or a vector field. Okay, you can also have something called a tensor. Now, a tensor is a generalization of scalars and vectors. Um, you can also have a combination of a scalar and a vector. Actually, a vector is um, a combination of a scalar and a pointer. And so it can have magnitude and direction, whereas a scalar only has magnitude and doesn't have direction. So every location in the field in a scalar is defined a, a uh, quantity, um, a magnitude of something. And in a vector field, so in a vector field, every location in the field of view is assigned a magnitude and a vector. Now, these uh, quantities can be um, mathematically expressed in, you know, complex numbers, quaternions. They could, you could have a four by four matrix assigned to every location in space. You could have some crazy 11 dimensional array assigned to every location in space. And so um, this is the generalization of the field where, you know, every point in space is assigned some mathematical um, quantity and depending on the situation you would choose a scalar or a vector or a tensor and use complex numbers or um, store it as a matrix uh, whatever is convenient for the application that you're working on. 
Now in the field of magnetism, there are two kinds of fields that, uh, that I'm interested in. One is the vector field and one is the scalar field. Now in the vector field, every point in the field of view, every location in the field of view is assigned a vector quantity. So the vector quantity is a, contains a magnitude and a direction, which is why you see little arrows everywhere on this field diagram. Now the scalar field, the scalar field, every, in the scalar field, every location in the field of view is assigned a physical quantity, but not a pointer. So it, uh, it, you're assigning a uh, quantity, a magnitude, to each point in the field. And, um, and, and in, in the isopotential lines, we were assigning, we were measuring the voltage potential um, at every location in space. And, and these lines are, are just um, uh, regions of, of equal potential. These are actually surfaces. These are literally lines. Uh, if you're a vector, if it's a vector quantity and it's got a pointer, it can't be a surface. It can only be a line. And in the case of isopotential lines, isopotential lines are really the cross section of an isopotential surface. So you can think of these as, as uh, three dimensional balloons that have been blown up. These are not balloons. These are more like strings that are connecting things together. Okay, so um, in terms of the vector field um, of a magnet, uh, what, uh, basically what we call that is magnetic flux. So these lines that you see, these lines that you see um, that they draw, this is just a map, a mathematical map uh, of little arrows that are pointing in a certain direction, depending on the location that you pick in and around a magnet. Now this word flux is interesting because um, this is a magnetic flux diagram. Here is another couple of magnetic flux diagrams. Now <clears throat> the word flux actually means to, ca um, to cause to become fluid, to become fluid. So these arrows are really pointing in the direction of flow. Now, historically, that flow has been um, uh, basically just an analogy and, and nobody thinks of it as being real. But if you think of this as ether flow, if you think of this as a fluid or flow of some kind, it can be, you know, air can flow, water can flow, ether can flow. So uh, just because I say flow doesn't mean I think it's water or water-like or a liquid but um, I would like to say that um, what is <clears throat> becoming fluid, what is becoming fluid in and around a magnet is ether. And so, you know, I would like to start talking about this in terms of ether flow. Here's an animation that I got from the video on divergence and curl from the Science Asylum uh, channel. And uh, he also claims that, you know, the flow that you can, that it's an analogy, that flow is just an analogy in terms of uh, electric and magnetic fields. But I'd like, like to try and indulge the idea that there is some sort of an ether and that something is in fact flowing. So this is the case of two um, unpaired charges. Okay, so this would be a positive charge and this would be a negative charge. And positive charges are, um, by convention, modeled as sources. So you can imagine, you can uh, visualize that ether is flowing out of this point right here. And this is the negative charge. Negative charges are generally um, visualized as sinks. And so you can see the ether is flowing into the sink. So it's flowing into the sink and out of the source. And the flow direction, now in the case of unpaired charges, okay, a source is always a source and a sink is always a sink. 
and there's no feedback loop getting back to the source. So what I like to do is I like to imagine that when the ether flows into here, it goes into, oh, let's give it a name. Let's call it, hmm, counter space. Yes, okay. So what I like to imagine is that this fluid of ether is flowing into counter space and then coming back out of counter space over here. And as long as there's an equal number of positive and negative charges in the universe, okay, this can this can be as long as as much ether flows into counter space as flows out of counter a counter space, everything is balanced and everything is fine. And so um, mainstream likes to use this visualization just as an analogy, and I'd like to bring it into more of a reality by invoking the uh, idea of counter space. Now here's a similar video, only now instead of positive and negative charges, what we have here is uh, the north and south pole of a magnet. Now it, the ether flow is very similar. In this case, we have ether flowing out of the source. So by convention, we've assigned the North Pole to as being the source and the South Pole as being the sink. And as you can see here, the ether flows out of the North Pole into the South Pole. Um, only the only difference here between the charges and the magnet is now there's a, um, a feedback loop. There's reciprocation um, bringing the ether through the magnet to feed the North Pole. So no longer does the ether have to go to counter space and out of counter space. In fact, counter space has moved here. In this, in this situation, you could, um, you could say that the ether is coming out of the source going through the south pole into counter space and then coming out of counter space and then completing the loop. Okay, so counter space is here in the magnet and counter space is here and here in the case of the charge. Okay, counter space is here and here, but not here, and not here, okay? It's here, and here, it's not here, and it's not here. And then in the case of magnetism, counter space is here, not here, not here, it's here and the ether is flowing from the North Pole out through space back into the South Pole, reciprocating through counter space. So it's going to counter space and then out or into counter space and out of counter space, counter space is here in the magnet. So here's another image. Uh, on the left you have, we have a positive charge and a negative charge and we have a North Pole and a South Pole. And looking at the, the static diagram, you can see that the source is always a source and a sink is always a sink and there's no connection back to the source in this condition, in the where you have unpaired charges that are close to each other. So ether can flow this way but it can't, it doesn't flow back up here. Um, in contrast to the magnet where the ether flows out here, comes up here and flies through the magnet through counter space. So it's actually going into counter space and then back out of counter space and going to the North Pole. Whereas over here, it's going into counter space, coming out of counter space through some wormhole or something. There's no direct connection between here and here in 3D space. The connection is through counter space. The connection is always through counter space, only in the unpaired charges, counter space is in a direction that 
we can't see. And in the case of the magnet, counter space is, is right there. So counter space is only here and only here and only here in the case of the magnet. Now, how do we turn this into this? Well, it's my opinion that you turn this into this by bringing the charges together and binding them in a system. So the difference between this and this is that these two charges aren't bound to each other. They're free to move around space, you know, at their will. And well, at our will, maybe. And the magnet, these, the north and south pole, the positive and negative charge, are bound to a object, to a physical object. They're bound to each other. And so um, if you bind these two, the positive and negative charge to each other, then you can have reciprocation because then the ether can come out of the positive and go back into the negative and go through counter space, which now is here instead of here and here. So this is just an idea I came up with the other day. I still have to work on it. Um, so I can show you, I can show you that um, when you bring two charges close together, when you bring two charges close together, well, even when they're far apart, even when they're far apart, you have a zero point in the middle. You have a zero point that measures uh, the equal potential that you measure is zero right here at the point between the positive and negative charge. And you can see that, you know, this is more, this looks more like a magnet and less like two um, independent charges. So my idea, my opinion is that the only difference between a magnet and um, two independent charges is binding. If they're bound into an object, um, such as, so this could be analogous to a hydrogen atom where the um, positive charge and the negative charge have a boundary condition, the boundary of the atom. So here's a picture of the isopotential field that you can find uh, and measure around a magnet. Okay, here's the magnet. Here's the, um, what I've been calling isopotential lines. But in reality, these are isopotential surfaces. And this is a scalar field. This is a scalar field because every point, every location in the field of view is assigned a value. And in the case of this potential, um, you can think it is basically a voltage measurement, at least in the experiment I did. I measured um, voltage in different locations around the magnet. And if you measured all the locations around the magnet, you would be able to define these isopotential surfaces of equal value. So if, you know, each point on this surface everywhere would have a value of say 0.06, and then this would be 0.05, and this would be 0.04. And then you can see that there's kind of an acceleration. This, this is a gradient, it forms a gradient. And so this depiction of a field around a magnet, of course, is different than the, the, the normal flux lines, which mainstream popularized as the magnetic field. So when you say magnetic field, you think of the, uh, you think of the flux lines usually, which are here. When they say magnetic field, right away you think of the flow, you think of the flux lines and not the, um, not this field, not the scalar field. Okay, and I just wanna show you quickly this video to show you the three-dimensional. Okay, this is uh, to show you the surface, that these are um, isopotential surfaces and not just lines or not just curves. Okay, when you intersect a three-dimensional volume and when you when you intersect a three-dimensional surface with a plane so this would be analogous to looking down the north and south pole so the isopotential lines the isopotential curves around the north pole are circular and the isopotential um, curves around the dipole when you look from the dipole direction 
um, look like that. So these are contours um, from a slice taken out of, let me go back to a good view here. There's a good view. So this is just a, uh, when you intersect the plane of an ISO surface, you get ISO curves. And so in radiation therapy, they call them isodose curves. And so this is analogous to isodose curves in radiation therapy. Uh, but they, uh, the isopotentials that I'm talking about, the isopotentials are um, really surfaces and not lines. And here is a picture of uh, electric dipole. So this is the uh, isopotential lines around an electric dipole, and these are the isopotential lines around a magnet, and there's really no difference. And they can be generalized to, to uh, lines or surfaces of equal strength because the voltage, the voltage measurements that I made uh, around the magnet are uh, directly proportional to the strength, the field strength, the strength the, that a test particle, that a test magnet, that a test charge would feel at that particular location on, on the surface. Okay, so each point on the surface, so if I'm here, if I have a little ball bearing, like I showed you in the ball bearing experiments, if I put it here or here or here or here, it's going to experience the same force uh, everywhere along this line. So that's uh, isopotential scalar field around the magnet. Now this field diagram is just as useful as the flux diagram. The, this is not better than the flux diagram. The flux diagram isn't better than this. Um, I like this diagram because it shows me the gradient. I can see clearly the gradient of the um, of the force field okay this is a field of forces and I can see the gradient and that will tell me um, that tells me a lot about what's going on around this magnet if I place a test particle here okay so it tells me a lot about the uh, forces that will be experienced in and around the magnet So next I want to talk about the similarities between the magnetic potential diagram and the electric potential diagram, the magnetic isopotential diagram and the electric isopotential diagram, which are very similar. In fact, there, there's no difference really between these two um, field diagrams. Okay, here's, here's another example. Um, when, and I showed you just a, a few minutes ago, that when you place uh, a volt, a, a reading, a Hall sensor, or whatever it is to read um, the potential around um, two uh, monopoles that are near each other, at the very, very center, you get a zero reading. And uh, same thing with the magnet. If I placed a my Hall sensor right here, I'm going to get a zero reading. And so in a previous video, I did this and I placed the Hall sensor there and I got a reading of 0 0.06, which is very close to zero. It was very difficult to find zero because it's a very small magnet and you know, you're basically the, if you look at at this diagram here, it's a very fine line. It's very, very hard to get exactly zero because, um, because there's a lot of ice, other isopotential lines close by. And so it, as, you, as you get closer to the magnet, you can see it changes really quickly. It changes really quickly. And so to, you have to get exactly halfway at the dielectric inertial plane to get a zero reading. Now, Ken Wheeler says that at the center of the magnet, there is no magnetism. At the center of the magnet, there is no magnetism. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you don't have any magnetism, you don't have any field strength. 
And so at the very center of a magnet, you get a zero potential. You get a zero potential. And same thing with at the very, at the halfway bet point between a positive and negative charge, whether that are close to each other, you get a zero reading. And the isopotential uh, li the lines, the isopotential curves, because they are in real life three-dimensional curves, three-dimensional surfaces in both cases. Okay, so the field diagrams for the isopotentials between um, monopole charges di in a dipole configuration and the magnet are identical. There is no difference. They are, for all intents and purposes, identical. So the next experiment I want to show you kind of um, shows you this gradient in real life uh, being read by the Hall sensor and displayed with the, um, with the voltmeter. Okay, so here is the video. And at this point right here, the voltmeter is reading 0.02. And then as I get closer to the magnet, then this changes to 0.03, and then 0.04, and then 5, 6, 7. You can see it's speeding up. I'm going at the same rate. I'm not moving towards the magnet faster. In fact, I'm moving almost at a constant rate between here and here. But as I get closer to the magnet, the readings right here. So now we have three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, blah, 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 very quickly up to the maximum when 1.4 when we touch the magnet. And so that what that is depicting, okay, I'm gonna show that again. Actually, I'm gonna overlay the isopotential line so you can see. And there's right now there's a reading of 0.02. And then when I get to the next line, it's going to be 0.03, then 0.04, 5, 6, 7, and, and then you can see uh, a very steep slope here. This would be referred to as a slope. It's a gradient, and I know we've talked about gradients before, so I'm not going to you know, explain that here, but everyone knows that a gradient is a slope, and a slope is like uh, a hill or a valley. In this case, it would be um, possibly thought of as a valley. So like I said before, isopotential field diagrams can tell you a lot about what's going on uh, around a magnet and around a, uh, a dipole, positive and negative charge dipole. Um, if you um, place an object here, for example, say a ball bearing or a small magnet, it's going to experience extremely uh, strong force because when I put the Hall sensor right here on the magnet, I get the highest reading of 1.40 or 1.41. But when I put this, the Hall sensor right here, I get a zero voltage reading. And so the forces felt right here are going to be much less than the force felt right here. In fact, if I had a, an infinitely thin uh, object here, if I had an infinitely thin magnet or an infinitely thin um, bolt piece of metal, uh, it would experience no force at the dielectric inertial plane of the magnet. Okay, so uh, in this next experiment, I'm going to show you um, how that works. And so in this experiment, what I have, okay, so I just want to show, oop, North Pole is up. North Pole is up. And uh, inside this little plastic housing here, I just have a tiny ball, ball bearing, like the one I used in the uh, previous, previous video. And so you can see, you can see, okay, let me run that again. North pole, ball bearing. And so I'm going to bring it close to the magnet. And as you can see, I'm able to pick up the magnet um, 
when I touch it to the North Pole. Okay, so the ball bearing can pick up the magnet, no problem. In fact, I'm going to put it, try to put it right in the middle here. It doesn't want to go there, but yeah, it stays there and I can pick it up. And um, so I have a very strong uh, force. I'm feeling a very strong force between the ball bearing and the magnet at the North Pole. Now, in right now, I'm trying to touch it to the dielectric inertial plane. I'm trying to find that sweet spot in, um, in the middle, and it's very difficult because the ball bearing wants to fly to the North Pole, or it wants to fly to the South Pole. So if the ball bearing is just a little bit on one side of the dielectric inertial plane, it's going to go one way. And uh, if it's slightly on the other side, it's going to fly the other way. And so it's very hard to find that sweet spot. But there it is. I was able to touch the dielectric inertial plane and lift up the ball bearing, and it does not pick up the magnet. It's only when it's at the North Pole, and of course it wants to fly to the North Pole, um, because it is um, Santa Claus. No, just kidding. Um, so here I am touching it to, so now it's up against the back wall here, and I was able to um, touch it to the dielectric inertial plane and not pick up the magnet. But again, see, it wants to, it always wants to fly toward the North Pole. But let's see, I've got a bit more time on this video, so I think in the end I'm able to uh, repeatedly, oh, you can see I can drag the magnet too, but there it is. Yeah, I'm actually pushing the magnet with the ball bearing. It's interacting. But again, I can go right to the very center of one of the poles and pick up the magnet. So what this is saying is, so when I place the ball bearing here, if I'm a little bit up, it wants to fly up here. Now, if it was a spherical magnet, that was a cylinder magnet, but if it was a spherical magnet, it would actually want to fly to here. It would want to fly to the top, to the very top. But with cylinder magnets, this this region here is kind of spread out, and so it really wants to fly. This actually wants to fly to the edge, but that is the edge. So with if the ball bearing is a little bit up, it's going to fly this way. And if the ball bearing is a little bit down, it's going to fly this way. But if it's right in the middle, if it's right in the middle, um, then the force is going to be very low. The force is going to be very low, as you saw, and uh, it was not able to pick up the magnet like it does when I place it here. So I found that really, really. So I find this diagram really useful because the um, the vector diagram, the flux diagram of a magnet doesn't really give me a clear idea of that that would happen but this diagram clearly shows me that um, there should be no forces right along this line and there should be plenty of force right at this point right here so in this next experiment i want to repeat what i did previously with the ball bearing uh, by placing it far away from the magnet but on uh, in a region where it will follow an isopotential line, only this time I'm going to use a tiny, tiny magnet instead of a ball bearing. And so here's my setup. So first what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a test without the magnet. I'm going to show you what happens when I don't place a magnet. Now you can see the... Um, the magnet is very, very small. So without the big magnet over here, this tiny magnet is not, um, it's not doing anything. So it's not rolling away like the ball bearing was. Now there still is a slight gravitational gradient this way. If this was a ball bearing, it would roll this way. 
Uh, for some reason, this magnet is not rolling, and I'm actually not sure why, because it should be. But um, anyways, so this is just to prove that um, to prove that without the magnet, it does not go anywhere. It doesn't roll anywhere. It doesn't roll uh, along any ice potential line. It just um, does its own thing. So it's there are no forces right now other than my finger acting on that magnet. Okay, so now the magnet is in place. And now when I drop the tiny magnet here, it follows the ice potential line. And I'm not pushing it. And it's actually taking almost exactly the same path every time. So if you can watch, you can see that is taking almost exactly the same path um, every time. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to replay that, only I'm going to place my ice potential lines, and you can actually I'll we'll do this a bunch of times. Um, you can watch that every time I do this, it follows the ice potential line. Until it gets up to here, it goes all the way along the line until it gets to about here, and then it flies up. It's flying up towards the magnet. It's going to end up either on the North Pole or on the South Pole. So probably on the North Pole because it's on the North Pole is actually facing um, me. So just for um, for perspective, this is a my camera is on. This is a tabletop. This is there's all the magnets that I collected. This is a tabletop, and my camera is facing down, and the magnet is over here, and the North Pole is facing this way, and the, um, so the North Pole is facing this way, and the South Pole is facing away. So this is exactly what I did in my previous video, only I used a spherical magnet instead of a, um, a cylinder magnet. Okay, now I'm going to do this again, only I'm going to use three magnets. And I wasn't sure what would happen. I thought there might be too much friction for the three magnets, but it looks like the three magnets are also following the isopotential lines. And so I made another video like this, where um, I'm overlaying the isopotential lines in the video image just to show now this is one of the reasons I want to do this was I couldn't really tell which way the tiny magnet was orienting itself um, as it was going along the line but clearly with the three magnets you can see that the, the three magnets are always aligning themselves orthogonal to the isopotential line so they are aligning themselves if you can hopefully you can see these little dash things in the video image which are basically um, this is you know base this is how iron filings would line up in this magnetic field if we threw iron filings onto this paper and so you can clearly see that these three magnets are always lining up orthogonal to tangent to no not tangent to uh, what am I thinking oh yeah normal to the isopotential surface. So this is just exactly the same thing an iron filing would do. If I placed an iron filing on this line, it would align this way. And the other thing I want to point out is that um, the dielectric inertial plane of the magnet is always aligns with the isopotential line. So the dipole aligns orthogonal to the isopotential line and the dielectric inertial plane aligns with, especially with the small magnets. It's easier to see with the smaller magnets that the dielectric inertial plane is aligning with the isopotential line. So that's kind of interesting because I am beginning to think that this is the dielectric field. We could call this the dielectric field because the dielectric inertial plane lines up with the um, with this field. And so I think that's kind of interesting. So in this 
little test here. This is just another way of showing that the this is just a bunch of circular magnets lined up. And as I try to get them unoriented with the field, they always line up orthogonal to the field. No matter where I place it, no matter what I do, it is lining up with these, um, these uh, tiny little lines here, if you can see them in the video, orthogonal to the isopotential um, lines, surfaces. Don't forget, these are surfaces. These aren't lines. This is like a big, this is like an intersection of a surface. And because this is on a tabletop, because this is on a tabletop, the experiment is being constrained to a plane, which is the intersection of the isopotential surface, which I showed you earlier in that video. So this is a really simple experiment. Uh, all I'm doing here is I'm taking my spherical magnet and I'm moving it back and forth um, up here and I'm showing how these strings of circular magnets are lining up with the with the giant magnet. And this is kind of, this is like my um, this is my ferrocell simulator. okay this is my macro ferrocell simulator because the nanoparticles, in the ferrofluid of the ferrocell uh, do exactly the same thing, which I'll show you in a minute. So now when these, uh, when this is in the middle, when this is in the middle here, then these line up nicely with my isopotential line. These are orthogonal to the isopotential lines or lined up with these little um, bright lines that you can see between the isopotential lines, which are where the iron filings would line up if we placed iron filings right there. Next, I'm going to play you a video made by Mike Palazzola. I'll leave a link uh, to this in, in the description. This is a ferrocell as seen under the microscope. I'm just going to play this video because there's some audio and I want you to hear it. And then uh, we'll discuss it uh, in, a, in a minute. Now there's a field, so the feral particles are going to start accumulating. So there you see the feral particles starting to emerge once he places the, mag the magnet in the field of And so the they're going to start joining and get longer and longer. It's the beautiful double helix beautiful double helix so I'm gonna move the magnet and if I keep the magnet close no matter where I move the magnet around the microscope they'll uh, follow I'm, a, I'm about four or five inches away so that's basically what I was showing you in my previous video with my little uh, circular magnets that when you move the magnet around, the iron filings move around, the magnets move around, and these nanoparticles move around. So there really is not much difference between the iron filings, the ball bearing, the tiny magnets, and these nanoparticles. Uh, I think the trick here is to have the um, to have the particles to have the particles or the magnets to be much smaller than the magnet that you are um, using to activate the the isopotential lines, and so in this case you had we have tiny circular magnets lining up. In this case, we have um, nanoparticles lining up. And in the case of this image, which I showed in several of my other videos, we have uh, iron filings uh, lining up with a magnet and a ferrocell. So this is the key. This is the image that, um, that I'm trying to promote as a nice evidence 
It's a nice experiment and nice evidence to show that the the light in the ferro cell uh, appears to be following isopotential lines. Okay, they appear to be following isopotential lines. Um, isopotential lines, as you know, are orthogonal to the iron filings. The iron filings always appear orthogonal to isopotential lines. And in this image, we have the ferro lands, we have uh, iron filings, and the isopotential lines are, are orthogonal to um, the iron filings and vice versa. So the iron filings are always orthogonal to the, I, the lines in the ferro lands, which is, was my first clue. It was my, the first evidence that I saw that the, at least in this field of view, with the dielectric inertial plane here in the north and south there, in this view, the lines appear to be following isopotential lines. Okay, so now I want to talk about magnetic vector potential. Now there seems to be some confusion about um, the isopotential lines compared to the magnetic vector potentials. Now I do agree that these two diagrams look very similar, but magnetic vector potential, which is this image on the right, um, is a vector field. And so it's got vectors, it's got arrows, and the isopotential is not a vector field because these are isopotential surfaces and surfaces cannot be vector. The only vector you can get from a, an isopotential field or from an isopotential surface is the normal to the surface. And so this diagram and this diagram, although they look very similar, are not the same. In fact, the magnetic vector potential can, um, is only valid for um, when you have charges moving. And so, but let's look at just a definition of magnetic vector potential. Um, so the magnetic vector potential, and you can see there's a little arrow on top of this A. And whenever you see an arrow in an equation and is on a symbol, it means it's a vector. So the magnetic vector potential is a vector field so it's a field, so every point in the field is, is, def, um, is assigned a vector. It's a vector field that serves as the potential for the magnetic field. And so I think the, this word potential here is a little confusing, and I think that is why I've run into some problems with people thinking that the ice potential lines are not, um, do not, describe what's going on in the ferro cell. So here it says the curl of the magnetic vector potential is the magnetic field. And it's expressed with this equation. Now there's only one problem with this. The problem with this is magnetic vector potentials are only valid when the man magnetic fields are produced by electric currents, as I show in this picture here. In the case of the ferro cell and the ferro lens, we are using permanent magnets. So the magnetic vector potentials do not apply to permanent magnets. They only apply to magnetic fields that are produced by electric currents. And so the argument that the, um, that the ferro cell can't be showing isopotential surfaces or isopotential lines because the magnetic vector potential because of this guy, right, because of this guy, um, is, is inherently flawed. And so I'm not going to get into the details of that. This is an argument I'm having with, with uh, one of my colleagues, I guess you could call them. Um, and so I just wanted to make this point very clear that when I say isopotential, equal potential lines, I'm not talking about magnetic vector potentials. Okay, I'm talking about isopotential surfaces and surfaces are not vectors and therefore isopotential surfaces cannot be magnetic vector potential. And again, um, in the case of the ferro cell, the ferro lens and all the experiments I did, I'm using permanent magnets 
And so this math does not apply to this picture. So I think that's an important point that I needed to make. Um, to And so I'm just going to end off this video with a couple of really neat pictures. Here's a picture I found today. This is a, a picture of a, a very close up, um, high, super, super high resolution of the some fields are in the sun. And I was really str uh, struck by the similarity between uh, this image, these little squiggly things and the little squigglies in the ferro cell. Whether they're related or not, I don't know. It just seemed familiar. Plus, uh, all of the squigglies in this image from the sun uh, have companion orthogonal, um, looks like isopotential curves to me. I'm not sure if they are, if they're related, if they're, but they might be. I don't know. I just found this today, so I'm having a look at that. And then this final picture has nothing to do with magnetism, but because we're in, you know, this coronavirus nightmare, uh, I thought it was kind of funny that I went for a walk in the woods the other day and I found this crazy looking uh, orchid like flower that had this, um, I think it's like a pollen pod or something in it. Uh, I think it's called a skunk cabbage or something like that. And I just was struck by how much this looked like the coronavirus and that, you know, that I found this in the woods. I've never seen it before. I've never found one before. I've definitely never seen this before. And so, you know, with this coronavirus stuff going on and me finding this, this would be, I would call this a fractal self-similarity. So this um, skunk cabbage is looks self-similar to the coronavirus and ironically one of the medicinal pur purposes of the skunk cabbage is for respiratory problems and so uh, nothing to do with magnetism but everything to do with the fractal paradigm and so that is just a fun uh, I think a fun way to end this video so I'm gonna leave it at that